Hello and welcome to another episode of the Edgy Futurist podcast. We are on episode 127, uh, but I think we've got, I think it's over 180 uh, different uh, episodes and different forms on the podcast channel. So please do check back and, and have a read with them. Uh, we're really delighted today to be joined by Martin Illenworth. Martin is a senior lecturer in English education at Sheffield Hallam University and associate with Independent Thinking. Yeah, Martin is a consultant for the National Association for the Teaching of English and a regular speaker for Independent Thinking. His first book, Think Before You Teach, urges teachers to reflect deeply on their motivation and reasons for being a teacher. His latest book, Forget School, argues that if schools don't respond to the real world of change, challenges and possibilities that face young people, they will become irrelevant. Uh, welcome to the show, Martin. Martin, how are you doing? Good, thank you. And that, all of that that you just said seemed reasonably true, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm good. I guess I'm like everybody else. I need a haircut um, and a nose wipe and um, I am sitting, zooming all day. But other than that, yeah, good. Brilliant. Uh, it's great to have you on. It really is. Uh, it's kind of, we had Rachel last, Rachel Lofthouse last week. Um, and I guess, and uh, given your background and, and, and the, your work and, and the themes of your book, we're kind of continuing a theme here, I think. Uh, this It wasn't intentional, but um, it'd be great to get into at some point in the episode, your your kind of take on teacher training and, 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 and your views on how that might look in the future. But uh uh, I guess let let's start off with um, you. You brought brought a book out last year called "Forget School," um, and it's kind of. Could you just give our audience a bit of a, a take on on where it came from and and kind of the different voices that you have in there? Sure, um, I've. Um, I mean, I left full time teaching um, back in. Oh, 2013. Um, and since then, I've been working at the university, but um, I've also been speaking nationally, well, internationally as well, but speaking um, around the country to teachers. And there's, you know, it, it seems to me there's a great sense of frustration with um, the sort of uh, the rate of change within schools in, in terms of the curriculum and keeping up with um, the needs of um, our young people. And what I did with this book, Forget School, I mean, it's born from a, um, a frustration that, that schools are becoming a little bit out of date. Um, I don't know if you've heard, but in schools, they still ask children to write with paper and pen in little exercise books. And um, that's a little bit weird because because the kids don't do it anywhere else. And there isn't an adult world that's waiting for them, um, you know, to, to produce this skill. Um, but what I did was I interviewed 20 to 30 year olds um, and this was over the last couple of years um, all before the, the, the pandemic um, and they tended to be people who were either self-employed or on the way to being self-employed so you know they were um, being a barista while they were getting their music career up and running or um, something like that you know so they were doing some kind of temporary part-time work whilst they were pursuing their dream um which which is a theme with our young people today as well you know um so for instance you know um these days uh, pursuing a career in music is pretty much a potential for anybody who wants to do that whereas back in the day you know when i wanted to be in a band it, it was certainly a hobby um, there was no suggestion that I would be able to um, get my music out there or perform gigs. And that's just not the case anymore. Um, the opportunities are there for those um, who are able to take them. So I, I interviewed 20 to 30 year olds and I asked them lots of questions. But on the, in the main, I said, what's good about what was good about school? What was no good about school? And what have you had to learn for yourself um, since leaving school? And the. Um, the chapters in the book are the themes and patterns that came out of that. So there are things like, uh, quite dishearteningly, really, um, the, the first chapter I put in there, because it, it was the most prevalent um, pattern, was confidence. We've had to learn confidence after school. Um, digital proficiency is in there. The, the, the fact that that is an absolute essential key skill. So that's that's not even just you know, the ability to have digital proficiency, but it, uh, to have digital um, 
services and be able to uh, use the internet, etc. But it's being proficient. Um, uh, the vast majority of young people were telling me that their work is on Instagram at the moment, and their ability to manicure their Instagram um, site is hugely important. You know, and and you look at. Um, the, the English curriculum at the minute, and it's filled with activities like um, write a letter to a friend, which is bizarre. Nobody, nobody, nobody of school age writes a letter to anyone very much. You know, I'm sure they wouldn't want to be so inefficient um, in these days of communicating. Um, but there were also things like um, networking, the importance of being able to network um, and to be involved in projects, being able to manage money. You know, lots of young people saying they'd left school with not a clue how much money they needed to, to live a reasonable life. Um, there were there was stuff around um, happiness and well-being. Not not as, you know, I mean, I think schools often treat happiness and well-being as a kind of remedial activity. You know, we need to have support systems in place when when people are un when young people are unhappy. Um you know, the young people telling me that that you have to, and, and I, I guess, you know, an increasingly pressurized um, work environment, you have to plan in the divide between work and your personal life, and you have to make space for that personal life. Otherwise, it disappears. It gets consumed, especially if your work is on Instagram and, and, um, and on digital mediums. Um, you may well feel that if you switch off, you know, you're losing a sale or, or you're, get, you're getting behind. And that you know, there's some uh, very clear difficulties in, in making distinctions between when you're at work and and when you're at play, you know, and they, and and then developing talents, um, making decisions, being creative, taking risks, you know, when you think about those, if you think about the work, you know, I ask teachers, think about what you're doing in the classroom, where are you? supporting children to be confident to make connections to network to develop relationships um to be ethical in their decisions um and um be creative and take risks and and you know often if i think back to some of my teaching i'm i probably wasn't um supporting them in many of those ways i'm yeah, listening to this sorry dan Joe, you got it I was just I was just going to say I'm just thinking a lot of what you're saying I think a lot of schools are and a lot of leaderships in in schools would probably would probably say around kind of well we've got the PS PSHE curriculum what what you sent I'm a, I'm a secondary school teacher um so the, the, that's what we tend to have in a secondary school like a, a a kind of wrap around curriculum that goes around the academics just which addresses kind of some of the things that you're saying so are you are you kind of saying well that should it should almost come in from the from the the outskirts of the of the overall curriculum and kind of and be a part of the main curriculum absolutely i think we, we need to weave you know explicitly confidence into the curriculum you know i mean i i recall one of one of the um young people um said to me and, and it's kind of stayed with me that having confidence is believing you've got something to say um and and that that sense you know and and, and presenting young people with a mix of independent opportunities to have something to say with group projects um, where there are genuinely real audiences, real purposes and real context, you know. So um, with the best will in the world, the teacher, as a, a secondary school teacher, is not a real audience. You know, you're the, you're the person that marks the books. You're the, you're the person that works in that abstract bubble of a classroom. A real audience is where you know the children are um, doing an exhibition, um, launching a book, um, writing on billboards at um, a railway station to tell everybody coming off the train what the what what the great things are to do in the town. Um, you know, a, a real audience is um, going to see your grandfather and um, asking him what was the best day of his life, transcribing what he says, coming back um to into the classroom doing genre uh transformation changing it from a, a non-fiction account to a story and then going back reading it to your granddad and giving it to him that's a real audience and a real purpose you know and if you want to develop somebody's capacity to read and write for instance i, I say give them a reason to do it um 
And I think these projects with, with definite um, uh, outcomes as much as anything else promote that sense of importance in the work in, in the work that um, children are doing um, sorry yeah no I, I I love it I love the fact we talked to um, Martin said and the team at XP school in Doncaster and uh, yeah. one, one of the things that he talks about is about making that learning meaningful and and he, he talked about a similar kind of project in terms of uh, like talking about the mines in the places where people were from and then doing it in real life. Uh, not just about PBL, the project-based learning stuff, but the whole concept of giving it meaning and, le and letting learners um, enjoy doing that experience and it'd be something that, that makes a difference in their world and it's, it, they make a connection to it. And I, I, I do really like that. One of the things you said early on, was around this idea about pace of change. And I wondered if we could just go to that before we get into some of your, um, some of the other elements of, of your book and also some of the other elements that you talk about. And you mentioned about how teachers become um, frustrated at the pace that the curriculum's changing. Um, and absolutely, uh, I couldn't agree more that it seems to be a new update. Um, Every, every month that we should we should add this in and we need to add this 16th century text and we need to make sure that we're doing these <laughs> uh, frontal, frontal adverbials and this and that and the other and somehow they've got to know that that's a split diagraph like my six-year-old who needs a five-year-old she was five when she started talking about split diagraphs now i didn't even know what a split diagraph was but it was really really important that that, that she knew that that was what it was called because knowledge is the future and it's not a uh, that knowledge and skills dichotomy. We're not asking that it's e an either or, but I think I'm, I'm 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 intrigued really because we we talk quite a lot that um and 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 I think it was Dan that coined this phrase where he talked about maybe um, evolution in schools and the education system is isn't going fast enough and maybe we need a revolution. But you mentioned kind of there that the curriculum is going so fast, but the whole system seems to be going slow in terms of its ability to change and adapt and be ready. I don't know what you don't know what your thoughts are on on, on that kind of that it seems like a they'll change some stuff really quick, but then the things that really matter aren't being changed. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we've we've got the same subjects basically that we had in 1900, um, and they're not really responding to to the needs of a world that is changing in all sorts of remarkable ways. You know, led. If you look at the history of the, of, of, of our language, for instance, um, the markers where we move on the era that we're in have always been to do with some kind of technical change. So um, if you look at um, the, begin the origins of um, modern English, it's to do with the printing press. The printing press spreads literacy um, and, and, and the world is changed. Um, in uh, you know uh, if if you study linguistics you're told there are three periods that there's early english middle english and modern english i would contend with you now that the internet has driven us past uh, modern english and we're now looking at a, a at a post modern english you know where the ways that we can communicate are entirely changed and yet we we we're, we're still paper based um, we are still looking at mediums, as, as I said, you know, like letter writing. Um, we're still asking children to write newspaper articles, which is bizarre. You know, n n nobody under 30 reads a newspaper in that way. Exam boards worry about the, the way in which um, the audience online is, is difficult to define and therefore it's difficult to mark anybody's work in terms of whether they've, they've written for an audience. But that's irrelevant. You know, and, and, and the way that um, children learn, because they do learn all the time now, they're, they're in control of their learning because they've got the, you know, the, the total sum knowledge of um, humanity in their back pockets with information democratically available. And, you know, for schools to be arbiters of, of um, information doesn't make any sense anymore. And neither does an exam that just requires us to um, remember things. You know that the need to remember things just isn't there as much. What we need um, is to be able to support people to um, be critical in their reading. You know, in this sort of post um, 
Donald Trump um, era, you know, post-truth era. Children need to be wary of these things, but also they need to be able to manipulate the algorithms themselves. You know, if, if, you're, um, if you're in a band, uh, you need to know when is the best time of the month to release your, your music onto Spotify or, or any of those other platforms, you know. And the answer is it needs to be on a Friday after payday about five o'clock in the evening when when people are you know, well obviously we don't go anywhere at the minute but when we do that's um when people are listening to new music and that's where that where they're they're, they're in, a, in a happy spot and likely to likely to make purchases or do downloads or or, or or stream the music um so children need that awareness not only of how to communicate but how to manipulate those streams um you know and 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 technology interferes with what is important all the time. I, for instance, have an O-level in computer studies from 1984, perhaps the world's most peculiarly useless qualification. Um, and I, I think that the, the genuinely, the, the, the really important um, learning strategy that, that, that children need uh, is to learn, unlearn, and relearn. They just need the capacity to be able to learn, unlearn, and relearn, because we're going to have to keep doing that. I mean, you know, we're looking at us teaching now using Zoom and using Slack and all the other um, our online uh, means of teaching that we've been doing since March. Um, I've had to learn all of those things. And because I'm in teacher training, I'm um, visit visiting, in inverted commas, lots of schools, and they've all got their own systems. So I'm having to learn four or five different systems um, just so I can continue with those meetings. Um, and I, th I, th I think the curriculum lag lags behind, you know, all sorts of ways in which the world is changing. So, for instance, you know, physical money is about to disappear, isn't it? Physical money is dying. And, and, the, and the fact that it's seen as unclean because it keeps changing hands, that the, the present situation is, is going to usher that out even quicker. But, you know, I'm, I mean, I, I'm an older guy I'm standing at a bar, you know, uh, young people have served me. And I'm waiting for my receipt, you know, having done um, contactless and everyone, and they're looking at, oh, you want, oh, you want a receipt, do you? You know, and it's, it's um, my, my, my point is in mathematics, how are we going to teach value when there's no physical money? Um, there'll, be, there'll be an answer to that, but it, 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 it doesn't seem to be a question that's, that, that we're asking at the moment. Yeah. And there's, there's one thing I've, I've, I've heard you talk about before, Martin, in that, um, which which is quite revolutionary as as an english teacher yourself uh was talking about how um spelling and grammar won't won't necessarily be um as important as we maybe see it today because because will, will we even write in a few years will we just speak to a to a, a, a voice assistant and that'll do it for us well long term you know um speaking with your mouth might become redundant it might be a, a, a fairly quaint thing to do but in the short term um, you know, we, we, we're talking there about um, primary school kids and digraphs and all the rest of it. And in um, primary school, the spelling, punctuation and grammar test, which is one of the tests you leave primary school with in year six, requires an understanding or, or a knowledge of 59 technical terms of grammar. Um, however, I, I would suggest to you that the, 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 the test itself is of, of very little um, use to the children. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever asked you for your primary school um, qualifications. I, I don't suppose they have. Um, not me, not me. <laughs> no. Um, you know, so nobody ever asked for your SPAG test uh, score. But, but it, it, you know, when, when, when the national curriculum at Key Stage 2 uh, was reformed, um, there, were, there were interim reviews with lots of the initiatives, um, you know, peer-reviewed um, by academics. But... Um, when the final paper came out, the spelling, punctuation, and grammar test had been added on. Nobody, you know, not Deborah Myhill, uh, no respected grammarians had, had had any opportunity to have a look at that. And I think that test is actually there so that primary schools could be measured. It's part of the measurement of schools. It's got nothing to do with the children at all. And of course, in, in the early years, 48% of kids were leaving primary school being told that they hadn't reached the um, expected level. Which, which which is bizarre because if, if 
if half the kids haven't um, reached the expected level, what does that say about the expected level? But to get back to grammar, um, I would say to you in, in maybe 10, 15 years time, laptops, phones, I don't think they're going to have keyboards. Or if they do, there'll be a sort of quaint application that, that nobody would really use. And I think when you're writing, in inverted commas, uh, writing will consist of your conversation with your AI device about, uh, you know, when, you, when, you, when you've done your writing, you will say, standard British grammar, please. And the machine will do it for you. Or you'll say, Swahili, please. And the, tech, and, and the machine will do it for you. And, and actually, grammar, if we want to see where that will go, which is, which, you know, there's only two parts to language, just words and how you organize them. And um, I think grammar in, the, in that set of instances will become your conversation with the AI machine about where you want the text, where you want the images, and what's, what and where you want the sound to come in. Um, I, think, I think that's probably the evolution of um, grammar. And I, I'm not even saying it's a good thing. I'm just saying I think it's a thing that's on the way. I wonder how we go about even <laughs> even kind of approaching that with, with our, our, our education system. Um, I was about to say our modern education system, but I, I suppose you'd beg to differ. Um, but the, uh, how do we... Most ninety nine point nine percent of teachers um, in the classroom would 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 probably laugh that idea out the room. Yet, yet we're at a point now where we're having this conversation, saying we we need we need to allow students to learn in a, in a, in a new way and learn new things. Um, how do we? And I guess it goes back to the core of kind of what we're about. How do we bring about that that evolution? How do we change the system instead of just sitting on the sidelines talking about it how do we how do we get back into the into the classroom and start making change happen and i guess you're in a quite a good position to answer this question martin because because you train teachers as well well i mean that's you know um in one way i'm i'm not in a very good position because you know one of one of the the themes of of, of the, the teacher training course um, is that um, you know I, I'll me and my colleagues at university will say you could try this interesting approach you could try that interesting approach how about doing this that or the other and often the response comes back oh that's really good but I'm not allowed to do that you know and um, increasingly because I think of exam anxiety um, you know there's there's more and more prepackaged one size fits all sort of curriculum being um, um, used across the school, uh, across the country. And, and one of the reflections that um, the young people made with me that, that I put in a, a chapter called Qualifications was that they've rumbled us, you know. They know the limits of the tests. They know what they are. They know they're just um, memory tests. And actually, they're of limited value. They know it when they're there. And, and yes, they celebrate passing and that th they're unhappy when they don't. But they understand, you know, when, when they get into, into the adult world, exactly the limitations of that. But that's the pressure at the moment, isn't it, is, is that um, qualification is important. And, um, you know, I'm working with a number of organizations at the moment, one being um, Square Pegs, which is an organization that looks at... Um, the interests of children who either don't go to school or find school extremely difficult for all sorts of reasons. Um, and they're looking at, you know, ignoring um, the government because government seems very set in its ways at the moment and, and appealing to business. Now, business are becoming, you know, big business is becoming increasingly um, frustrated with the curriculum in schools in not um, supporting children to be things like creative, to be curious, um, to take risks, to do divergent thinking. You know, I mean, there's so much of education where we, we ask children to go from A to B by the shortest route with no deviation. And that becomes an activity in guessing what the teacher wants, you know, what, what is the right answer. And that, that, that just disallows you to have your own thoughts. And that sort of divergent thinking with, with, with fewer questions in a lesson and, and open questions, you know, um, that encourage the idea that, that, that there might be a range of possible solutions and supporting the children to bring in their own interests um, into the classroom. 
so for instance um let me give you an example from my own teaching um let's let's uh, you, you know we've got a class that are, that are doing um a level literature and we're doing bird song by sebastian folks and we're going to for the exam we're going to be writing an answer about bird song and about um some poetry written in the first world war which you know so that's the theme of bird song um but, you know and so the, the the actual assessment is writing a literary essay about a novel and some poetry so we need an appreciation of the first world war and and maybe you know a long time ago when i began teaching i probably might have lectured the children and made them make notes on the first world war and it would have been desperate it, you know it would have been written down and kids may or may not have managed to you, you know um take that on board you know when, when when we first had the computer you know sending home kids to research in inverted commas and they used to bring back four pages of wikipedia they hadn't read and said there you go sir there's, there's, there's your own work but now what i like to do is i like to say you know what what would you like to know about the first world war what what would be of interest to you oh sir sir I've, have you seen that trench foot oh i said right you go away and find out about that sir what did they eat at the front oh, i'm not sure go and find out about that and if it's anything nice cook it and bring it in um so why 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 would the soldiers get out of the trenches and start running when they knew they'd probably get killed i don't know go and find out about that you know and then you, uh, let kids become expert in a perspective and let that let them bring their own interest to to the situation um i mean one, one sorry go on no no i was just i was just gonna say you reminded me um of uh, I, I had the, the great fortune a few days ago to interview terry deary who's the author of the horrible history books um and you reminded me of something he was saying in that he was he was saying that he, he's adamant, even though I, I, I pushed him quite hard on this, he's adamant that he doesn't write history, but he, he just he writes about human stories. And, um, and, and, that, and that's kind of what pulls in uh, the, stu the students and children to, be, to actually want to read his books, because at, at the end of the day, they are history books, but it's actually just the, the human side of things. And actually, it just made me think, and like when you were saying there, it, it made me think like, have we even got the point where we've where we've lost our way of how to how to how to communicate how to capture the imagination of 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 our children and make them want to be creative and want to learn and want to want to be inquisitive about the world? Yeah, I mean it's it's that abstract bubble of of, of the classroom. You know, um, kids come to school because they have to. We we just as a society we decided that's what they do. Um, they get five live broadcasts a day that that disappear off into the ether um and i mean one of the one of the just listening to you there one of the things that i've um written down as one of my pieces of advice moving forward is to immediately reinstate the school trip which has been tripped up uh, excuse the pun by um the red tape and the admin and, and the safety and what have you um but you know in in, in looking at birdsong i used to try i used to take um the young people to Belgium and to um, northern France to the, the war memorials and what have you and we had a magnificent uh, guide Robin Stewart who's from Sunderland actually um, who used to tell stories and that's how you that's how you support children to connect with something as vast as the, the you know the first world war not telling them huge numbers of people um, that, that died you know statistical numbers but actually standing at somebody's grave and saying, you see this guy here, he was shot for desertion. And you see on his grave, it says January the 14th, he was he, he died. But actually, it's not true. He died on Christmas Day because he was shot on Christmas Day. But the army decided that was too terrible a thing to admit to. So they've, they've just lied about the date on his on his grave. And that's one of the one of the graves in the prison behind um uh, sorry, uh, yeah, behind Eep Prison in in Belgium, and just it's the stories and the relatableness. And you know, if 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 you're doing the First World War, then you get kids to look up their last name in the Commonwealth, uh, um, war, you know, War War Graves Commission website. If you look up my name, Illingworth, in the First and Second World War, about 110 Illingworths died, and they're all from um, 
Yorkshire and Northumberland and, and, and the places where my family has spread. And that's engaging for me as a learner in, my, in, in that topic because I'm using something that feels very real. You know, I, I had a student um, on the back of that kind of experience at A-level who'd, who'd passed all the other modules. And on exam day, you know, her, this, this was um, back in the day when there were six A-level modules. So she, basically she got five A's. And then for her work on the First World War, in comes a grade from the exam board. And it said E. And I thought, oh, my God, her dad's going to kill me. You know, because she was she was wanting to go to Durham University to read literature and what have you. And I thought this must be wrong. So I put an appeal straight into the exam board um, and it did turn out to be wrong. But that's not the point. A couple of days later, you know, somebody in the office said, oh, or, um, you know, this this young lady's dad is on the phone. I thought, oh, no, I'm in trouble now. And I started trying to apologize to him. You know, oh, it must be a mistake, blah, blah, blah. And he said, no, 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 Mr. Ellingworth, I, ju I just want to tell you what, what um, Phoebe, that was her name, Phoebe said. She said um, when she heard her score, she said she felt like she'd let the soldiers down. You know, and that's, that's a kid genuinely in touch with, with, with the education. They actually want to write the exam, you know. Um, but there seems to be this thing at the moment where – you can be brave and you can make people who are linguists uh, in, the, in the terms of, of English, which is my expertise, or students of literature, who, um, you know, on the back of that will, will be able to do tests or you make test doers. Um, and, and, and to not make test doers is seen as an act of foolhardy bravery, I think. Um, but I think if, if, if you get, you know, I think the motivated are always going to outperform the unmotivated. Um, yeah, that's what I say. And, um, yes, it's, it's, it's very divisive at the moment. Yeah. You brought up exams there. Um, <laughs> I know you, you, you did a bit of research in Canada. You go into and... exams, Dan. We, we never talk about exams. <laughs> oh, I, I feel like that's all we talk about at the minute. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I'm really interested because it's the one aspect that we haven't covered on the show is, um, is the the Canada uh, way of doing it, and and I know you you kind of you went off over there, um, got some funding to be able to go and do some research there, and uh, could you just give us a bit of an insight about about how they do things over there? I can absolutely, yeah. Um, I got some funding back in twenty eleven, it was, um, and I recommend this to any teacher. Um, in, in about December, um, Goldsmith Institute advertise for people who want to do um, research into education and they will give you at the time and i'm sure you know it might be some equitable amount of money they, they would offer you up to three thousand pounds to do a piece of research so you you make application you go down to um an interview goldsmiths institute is around the back of st paul's cathedral and um i don't know if you know around the back of there it's all glass fronted you know clothes shops with seven items in that all cost 700 pound but in the middle of it there's this wonderful old building where everything you know stone building and everything inside is wood paneled and you get interviewed there and uh, um, basically there's about seven um, people on one side of a bale for mead table and you on the other side you know quaking in your boots um, but um, yeah I managed I managed to convince them that going to Canada to investigate teacher training out there would be a good idea um and I, and I thought it was a good idea because um in canada there's no national um curriculum the curriculum is organized at, at the federal level so in districts so i i was um working with the university of toronto um and uh, in toronto unsurprisingly and um the, the, it was the Ontario School Board that regulates uh, the exams. So when I say the exams, there are no exam boards. Teachers write their own exams. They mark the exams and they award the grades. Now, I, I can feel everybody shifting in their chairs, you know, because that would involve trusting school teachers, um, which which would be a bit, a, bit of a... Um, don't you dare speak such left-wing ideas, Martin. <laughs> Just in teachers. 
Um, well, do you know what? Funnily enough, that's exactly what we're having to do now. So um, uh, that's of interest. <laughs> so what happens is if I've got a class of um, however many kids, I can write as many exams for those kids as I, as I can bear to or want to. So if I've got kids who work in different ways, I can write different exams for them so they can show, you know, the best level of their acumen. And that I really like. Um, and I like it because, you know, I, I think that at heart, our exam system has a, a real problem because if you're going to have winners, you have to have losers with our exam system, you know, and, and the examination should be no more than the thermometer reading of where we're up to after um, being in school from age four to age 16, for instance. But the way that our exams work is, um, you know, it's it's the Harry Potter sorting hat, isn't it? These people can and these people can't. Um, but, you know, what what about a kid? I know a kid um, who can, um, he's always asking me if I want a pet or a breeder and talking about ferrets. He knows everything about ferrets, this lad. He can tell you, um, what's the best way to keep them, how to create a good living space for them. He can tell you, um, you know, what age they become, because when, when, they're, when they're young, they're sort of malleable and, and like a pet, but they get vicious when they're older. He can tell you about that. He can tell you about what to feed them. He can tell you with a newborn ferret what sex it is. The kid is seriously skilled, but he's not very good at reading and writing. So, you know, we bundle them off from school saying he's, he can't do anything. And um, th this sense of winners and losers, I think, is, 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 is the thing that we need to address. Children should leave school age 16 or 18 or whatever age it is they leave with, uh, an, in, in, in my suggestion, an, an e-portfolio of what they can do. Not what they can't do, what they can do so that they can show those things to prospective employers, or they can use them as the basis of their own self-employment. And maybe that document could stay with us, you know, throughout our lives. So it's got a record of our reading. It's got a, a record of our experiences. It's got an, um, a record, you know, and because it's an e-portfolio, it could be video presentations. It can be visual images of things that we've made and things that we've done. And in that way, we, we're saying, you know, here are the range of skills. And, and this is the acumen that this particular person has. And, you know, a, a lot of these young people that I've interviewed who, who were, um, let me give an example. The, uh, a young lady who has her own wedding design company. She was looking to employ somebody to work with her because her work was expanding. And um, she said, to, I said to her, so, what, you know, what do you look for? What, what, when, when you're going to interview them, what will you look for? And she says, oh, well, I need um, somebody who's pretty creative. Um, I need somebody who's a people person, you know, got a bit about them. And I said, hang on, what about um, uh, maybe um, an, an art, an, an A-level, or do, do you want a degree? No, no, not bothered about that. You know, and that increasingly is, is what I'm hearing. And, and it's because there's a generation of kids who are now young adults with whom – we, because we've had to as teachers, we've gamed the system. And whether we've told them that, that the exam is important or it's not important, kids understand the limits of it, you know. And, and in something like wedding design, um, in uh, all, so, all sorts of, certainly in the arts, all sorts of different things, people just want to see what you can do. They want to see your portfolio and they want to get a look at you. Can you communicate? Are you going to be somebody they want to work with? And let's have a look at what you've achieved so far. And if if what you've achieved so far is 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 to fail your French GCSE, then pff, that's neither use nor ornament. Totally agree. Totally agree. And uh, that portfolio of evidence is something that um, we've been kind of championing for a bit. So it's nice to be able to um, be able to hear that. I think the whole idea around what students can do rather than what they can't do. I love that. I love that that it's more than a number, more than a grade. That is that this is kind of um this is why we became teachers. We didn't become teachers to create um to become factory 
an exam factory and they all get a grade and they're all ranked. And, and I remember having a conversation with, um, I think it was De uh, Deborah Kidd, who, who, you, who you know well as well. And we were talking about this idea about ranking people in order and how difficult it, it, it was to rank 30 children in order and then 300 children in order and then 3,000 children in order. How, I, I, and, and, and what's the morality of that? Of, of and I think there's a there's a, a wider moral question, isn't there? Here as a, a about the, the the moral purpose of education and what we did it for. Whether it's about getting more, and we've, we've all seen those definitions uh, that talk about what the purpose of education is about getting more knowledge in, and that people will know more and remember more. It's just nonsense. It's just it just feels so so backwards. I think you've. You've talked about this idea that exams are the least that employers look for. It's like kind of it's the lowest common denominator. I had a a, a, a lecturer that I was working with just the other day, and uh, he literally got a piece of paper and he wobbled it, and he said, "Every person is going to come out of college with one of these. Every person is going to have a diploma. So what is going to make?" And I watched him in front of students. He says, "What are you are you going to have that's different than this? Because everybody's going to have this." And and I think there's there's something there's something in that in there. I mean, you, you you know yourself in school when you, when you interview people now, you interview the people for the job, and then you only look at the reference afterwards just to make sure you you know that they're not a baby snatcher or something, and um, that that because you want to have a look at them, see if they're the sort of person you want to work with, listen to their their principles and their ethos and what what it is that they're saying they want they want to do in terms of teaching, listen to them talking about the successes they've had with kids. That's what I did. I, you know, you, you don't read the reference until afterwards. Um, and businesses increasingly are like that, you know, because if a kid's got millions of A stars, it's actually a reason to mistrust them as a leader because what all that shows is that they've, um, well, to be fair to them, they've got a good level of intelligence, academic intelligence, but it shows that they've learned to do what they're told. And that might not be what you want, you know, um, it, it, it would certainly won't be what you want in, in terms of um, the skills that are valued, you know, and the, the, the international business organization is constantly talking about the top skills are creativity, critical thinking, things like that. Um, uh, ingenuity and, 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 but, and, the, but then also, um, also on that list, some personable skills, and if you're sitting passively in lesson after lesson, guessing what the teacher wants, and then tr desperately trying to remember it so you can pass the exam in a boiling hot gym in May, um, I, I don't think that, that supports you in, in that sense of developing talents, making decisions, being creative, you know, and, and I, I think you're right. I think um, teachers teachers sense that. And, and and the troubling the troubling response, of course, that, that you get all the time is, but what can we do? That's the way it is. Um, and and teachers need not to accept the, the the way it is. You know, my answer is if, if you understand something isn't right, if you, if you don't speak up, then it'll stay not right. Yeah, it's uh, it. I find it interesting, and we we talked to Rachel Lofthouse about this last week, and. That, that whole idea of that the the government at the moment are are supporting um kind of this what they see as a new type of teacher training where it's it's teacher it's getting teachers who are going to be focused on a knowledge rich curriculum and and I can't help but think that they that that kind of hold they're going to be holding this up as the almost elite teacher training units that that are going to go out there and kind of show how it's supposed to be done where whereas actually what we've just talked about and, and kind of that, that whole morality idea that Ben brought up there, that are we, are we getting, are we going further down this line of, of getting it wrong and, and, and to a, to a, a really culpable extent where we, where, where children's lives could be, um, could be affected here. I mean, you have to, you have to watch out for the word knowledge. Um, these days it's, it's, it's fallen <laughs> into the wrong hands. Um, and knowledge rich means knowing facts, as far as I can see. Um, it's, you know, back to didactic teaching and um, tests of memory and knowing things. And it's based on this sense that, before, you know, and, you know, there's limited um, value in it. The, the idea that um, you need to know something before you then apply it. Um, 
but it just extends in in the documentation you, you really have to watch out for the word knowledge um you know there's there's a distinction to be made between information and knowledge um i try to teach my trainees this by i have um a cartoon of um uh, there's lots of variants of this on facebook but a cartoon of uh, winnie the pooh and piglet walking into the sunset and um uh, piglet says um you know that i voted leave are we still friends Pooh?" and Pooh says um and i'll bleep out the expletive um <laughs> no we're not i've always known you're a idiot and you know I, I, the difference between uh, information is 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 just facts knowledge is you know everybody laughs when they see that and that is knowledge because you know what leave means in that context and you know it's inappropriate that winnie the pooh is swearing that's knowledge knowledge rich curriculum is about knowing facts it's that sort of um descriptive knowledge rather than procedural knowledge you know um so it which is the same with things like the spag test the spag test is about being able to circle the adverbs in a sentence not about being able to make um, application of that i wrote to the dfe once about the uh, spag test when I, I still felt i might get an answer and um one of the questions was um uh, there was a sentence and it said oh i know what did it say um the sun shone gap in the sky. The sun shone something in the sky. And you had to um, put in an adverb. And, of course, the number one answer that kids gave um, was brightly. And that was also the number one option on the mark scheme. Um, but that question is just about knowing what an adverb is and, and popping one in. So I wrote to the DFE and said, yeah, we can, we, we can have that question, but could we have another could we have another mark, please, for giving an explanation of our choice? So, you know, and when I work with trainee teachers, I say, so my exam, I'm going to put the word dutifully in that sentence. The sun shone dutifully in the sky. Um, and it's because uh, in my story I'm writing, um, we, we, everyone goes to bed and the next day they need good weather because we're going to have a fair on the green. Chapter two, the sun shone dutifully on the sky. So that's the dis distinction between descriptive knowledge where I, I know I can tell you in a knowledge rich kind of way what an adverb is to procedural knowledge where I can make use of it. And and, and that isn't um, reflected in, 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 in these new curriculum initiatives um, quite so much. What would you say to, I'm just thinking of kind of the, the devil's advocate of this and I, and I don't kind of, I don't do this often for, for the government, but they, they're all, I think one of their main arguments is that is the whole idea of leveling up so that you can, you can get, you can get a bunch of middle-class children into a classroom and start applying straight away because they've got the, the cultural um, knowledge from their background already in place and but actually the, those students in the class who who don't have that um that that rich cultural background won't have the knowledge and therefore you're just kind of deepening the gap between the 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 more upper class kids than the 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 working class kids i guess uh, for want of a better term there um how would you address so, that well you call that leveling up isn't it leveling down yeah yeah it is you know at, 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 the, at the root of things it's leveling down you know, if you if you want to support, um, you know, for want of a better expression, working class children, you need to make sure that they've got access to digital resources. It, as it would be a much better boon for, uh, for for doing that. Support them in developing happiness and well-being, in being able to manage money, to develop their talents, um, to network, to be involved in projects, to feel part of the school community um to, to to bring in um aspects of, of of their life that they that that can be applicable in the classroom leveling um up stroke down um in terms of creating foundational information um strikes me as a regressive move that's what i'd say but it would fall on death for you yeah yeah <laughs> i get it i get it i get it 
it's, it's really interesting this leveling up and this uh, or leveling down as you say and this idea of um i don't know the, the what this whole idea of the catch up curriculum and that we've now got a director of catch up and or a minister forget whatever whatever the title is now it, 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 I get it. I get it. I, I wonder. Wonder whether we've we've got. We should do a little bit more about what we've learned as humans in this uh, in this time. Because yes, we might learners might not have gone through the curriculum like we've been talking about. That's that's uh, that that is knowledge. But there must have been some stuff they've learned. What 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 have the some some of them have, have become really good at a certain computer game. Some of them have, and and that's actually a skill that that might lead them into a new career path or it might well be that they've, they've made connections with people online across the world that they've maybe not been able to do before. Now I might be being, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like some kind of um, rose tinted and I might be seeing the best in, in, in stuff, but there is probably some stuff that people have learned and valued more now than ever. I know that the conversations I have with, uh, with some of my friends is that, yeah, uh, it's difficult being in the same house with the same people all the time. But it, when when you're seeing people losing family members and 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 lack of connection, it makes you appreciate what you what you do have. Um, and there's something that's been learned in this time as much as anything else. Maybe not just what's been forgotten in this time. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, you know, I, I don't think you should beat yourself up for um, reaching high. Um, I think that's probably a very good thing. You know. Um, that that sense that if if you can imagine it, then 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 it has potential to happen. Um, yeah, I mean, the, you know, my trainees at the moment are in um, a whole range of different settings, and, and they're learning um, a remarkable amount of skills about the act of teaching, um, and the craft of teaching. Indeed, you know, obviously the government opened schools on the first Monday in January and closed them on the Tuesday. And then my trainees were going into schools the following week. So, you know, we were flung into a chaotic situation. So at the moment, I've got trainees who are on um, in school placements, some of whom are delivering lessons from home on, on things like Zoom um, and Microsoft Teams. Um, I've got trainees who are at home and recording sessions, and then children are watching them remotely without the teacher. I've got people who are going into school and working with key workers, uh, children and vulnerable children. And I've got um, trainees who are going in and working with those children. And there's, you know, a blend to the learning because the Zoom kids are there as well on a screen. And we're all in there. And, and you know, I think there are things for us to take away from um, these new these new modes of, of, of learning. Um, I've been learning all sorts of things since last March, and uh, you know the we may well uh, stop doing academic tutorials, for instance, face to face. You know, to, to get somebody to come from Middlesbrough for a twenty-minute conversation with me to go back. You know, that's a two hundred mile round trip to talk to me for twenty minutes. We, we'd be as well using Zoom, and um, you know, in terms of, of uh, you were talking about jobs and the future, well. You know, there are so many jobs that 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 just either aren't there or are unimaginable to to our sense of careers. You know, I, I bet if you surveyed most teachers, they would say that um, working in a bank was a good job, a good, safe, secure job, and they are hundred percent wrong. The banking is something that's increasingly automated. I bet they would say that being a lawyer is a good job. And all sorts of um, uh, legal practices are being automated, you know. Um, there's all sorts of professions that are there at the minute that are going to be very much changed. And all sorts of professions that aren't there that that, um, that will be there, you know. And actually, being a good gamer might very well um, end up being something that's useful. You know, and I think games and apps are something that, that increasingly you're going to see in the classroom as well. Um so, you know, I, I saw um, Guy Claxton a number of years ago. I, I went to see him speak at a, a conference um, in Derby, I think. And um, I, at the time, I was feeling quite unimportant. My, my head teacher had got me to come along with him, I, th I think, to translate for him. Anyway, um, the first thing that Guy Claxton said was, was, what will children need to know in 15 years' time when they're, when they're the adults in the world? And I thought, oh dear, 
I've been here 30 seconds and I'm already out of my depth. You know, what a disempowering question for school teachers. What do kids need to know in 15 years' time? What what bit of geography is going to be supportive? Um, how will we be writing? Um, you know, all sorts of things. What, 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 what would the history curriculum be that we needed to inform the lives that we're living in 15 years' time? And uh, Guy Claxon said, they said, uh, the answer to the question, what, what, what will kids need to know in 15 years' time is, we don't know. And I thought, brilliant, I got the first one right. But then, of course, he says, so what will we teach them? Um, and that, I think, is an ever-changing thing. But, but I, I go back to that idea of being able to learn, that capacity, that, that, the capacity to learn so that when they have left school, they've got the presence of mind to deal with the things that are thrown with them. And, you know, the, 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 the adult world that young people are going into now is so much change from the adult world that, that I went into. You know, I went into my first job. I could get a mortgage on a house and I could get a car. Kids these days, they just can't do those things. So what they do, you know, um, I think older people think young people are profligate with their money, but they spend it because they have no chance of doing anything el else with it. Um, and they certainly don't worry about things like pensions um, or saving. And they, 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 they use their money in, in, in more immediate ways because, you know, they, they, in, in lots of ways, young people are disadvantaged at the moment. You know, you can't, you can't begin to be an adult, you know, and, 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 and have adult relationships if you still live with your mum, you know, when you're 25, 35 or whatever. Um, and, and, but this is becoming increasingly a norm. And, you know, it, it, it's um, adding to the, the hit of confidence that, that young people are taking at large. Yeah, it's it, a good friend of the podcast, David Price. He, I think he, he explains it as we, we're going to be a generation of slashers. So, um, so you're going to have one job, slash another job, slash another job, slash another job. Um, and, and I think it's even like part of my job, I'm, I'm on the leadership team of a secondary school and one of my jobs is to oversee careers education. And even then we still kind of refer to it as what career, what career are you going to have like in the singular? What career are you going to have? Um, and well, it's that, yeah. I was just going to say that's, that's the expectation you left school with and I left school with, you know, was um, the careers person sat you down. And whatever they, you know, used to do those computer things, didn't you? And it said you you should be an art dealer or something. Yeah. And um, that what whatever it said you should do, the concept was was that you would always do that. So if you were going to be a, a police officer, the idea was that you'd join when you're 18 and you'd leave when you're 48 or whatever, and that would be the job that you'd do for life. And, and that's kind of moved on a little bit, you know. I, I think for myself, I. I I could have just stayed as a school teacher and seen my days out at the, you know, I was working in a very comfortable school, you know, and I could have just seen my days out. But um, I thought, oh, I'll try something else. I'll, I'll try being a university lecturer. And then I got asked to write some books. And then I asked, got asked to, to, to do talking um, about education. And, and it's just been life affirming, you know, it's just given me a real boost. And, and I don't think young people, see careers the, the way that we would do so you know when um everybody's gnashing their teeth and wailing about um you know people leaving the teaching career after a couple of years well that's what young people do they do they, you know like teach first for instance a, as a means into teaching is, is sold as a, ch a charitable act you're going to do um teaching for a couple of years and you might go around the, the world for a year and then go to the city and get a proper job and earn some money you know um but kids could see that, um, that they can move. I mean, one of one of my one of my uh, lads is a graphic designer, and he must have had four or five jobs since he, he left uni, you know. And and he goes where the projects are and what interests him, and um, then he has his private work, you know, where he he does artwork for bands and stuff. And kids, they just they just view, as you say, you know. I think I wrote a little bit in in Forget School about um, the notion of the slasher. Um, but kids, kids see, I'll do this for a bit, I'll do that for a bit. And, but but that's because, you know, years ago, it, that, that the whole notion of the careers officer, they were looking for something for you to do for life. And that's based in the idea that the education you get at school 
lasts a lifetime. And that is absolutely ridiculous now. Yeah, and I guess it goes back to that that thing that, that you've said a few times of, of learning, um, unlearning and relearning and, and that, that core skill that that needs to be at the, the centre of the curriculum. Doesn't matter what what we're learning about, that 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 skill. Uh yeah, Martin, what's what's next? So you've you you forget school was out last year, or are you are you working on anything else? What's what's in the pipeline? Um at the minute I am writing two chapters for a book um by an organization called square pegs that have um linked up with another in, uh, organization called independent thinking that you might know um i'm 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 one of the independent thinking people um and we we're, we're writing this um book together about children who for whom school does it just doesn't work that either they don't go or or they have a terrible time um, I am writing the chapter about assessment, um, and then I'm also writing a chapter about making it relevant, making edu uh, schooling relevant. And I'm also mulling over writing another book um, with the title Putting the English Back into English. Um, again, <laughs> you know, for the, for the English curriculum, um, because it seems to me that um, we've lost... You know, years ago, English was a really popular subject, and now it's um, become increasingly less popular with children. You know, um, and yeah, I don't know. You you, you you can see a lesson where there's a, you know, literature is in the room, but nobody's talking about it. You know, it's just there, and we're pulling it apart and analysing it. We've not even read it or found out who wrote it, why they wrote it, when they wrote it, who they were intending to. Um, read their poetry and um we're just looking for onomatopoeia um so yeah i'm i'm mulling that over and whether i can <laughs> take the hit on <laughs> from um people being cross with me i just want to jump in there because i was i was laughing really loudly but my microphone was switched off when you <laughs> when you said when you said that about we don't care about the context or anything we just we're just looking for onomat onomatopoeia um that was brilliant <laughs> uh, well, uh, you know, uh, I, I've watched a lesson a while back um, where uh, the, the poem, um, th there were 16 kids in this classroom. And, and as fortune or design would have it, there were 16 lines in the poem. And um, the lesson consisted of um, uh, everybody was given a line, one line of the poem, and then a massive um display on the whiteboard came up of um loads of literary and poetic devices and we had to look through all these poetic devices and find any that were applicable to our one line and then write um you know a point evidence quotation paragraph about it we never once read the poem um and we didn't find out anything about it and then you know the teacher reflected with me afterwards that the kids didn't really get into the um lesson and I said, well, that poem was written, um, it's all about apartheid. And it's about how, you know, you can get rid of apartheid in South Africa, but you can't change what's in men's hearts. And there are two interesting things about this poem. One of them is that um, the guy who wrote it, there's a suspicion that the government bumped him off. In a, in a, he was involved in a fatal car accident. Oh, that's interesting, they said. I said, I know it's interesting. It might have been good to tell the kids that. And I said, and the other interesting thing is that um, this guy who wrote the poem um, isn't actually from South Africa. He's from Egypt, and, he, and he's, he's whiter looking than you or I. Oh, that's interesting. You know, and, and it's just that putting the, the heart and the, the engagement and, and, and how language might speak to children rather than um, wondering how many beats there are to the bar. Never a true word said, Martin. I think, I think that applies to to so much around the curriculum, knowledge, um, skills, but just that passion for learning and exploration around so much more than just the the, the content that's just given, um, and sometimes the shackles that we give teachers um, don't give them a freedom, autonomy, I mean, or anything else to do that. But um, some people are happy with the shackles, and and, and it's such a shame that, um, yeah, I think you've you've given a real insight in in terms of how we can do it, what we should be doing. And I think with, with people that are um, overseeing and supporting 
the future teachers. Um, I think we've. I think the future's bright. I think. Um, I think it's. It really is. Uh, and I think if we we need to get more people like yourself. I think, like I said, we met Rachel Lofthouse and the great work that's happening up there. And I think there's some great practice that's happening. Um, let's Absolutely. not listen to to the changes that I think uh, the government is saying we need because actually we've got people that are doing it that actually are making more sense in my opinion. Um, it's been great. I'm looking forward to the next bit of work. Um, don't want to cut you off. If you've got anything more to say, Martin, sorry. Well, I, I, I just, you know, I just wanted to flick with you that, you, yeah, you, you, sometimes as a teacher, you have to justify what you're doing to people for all sorts of reasons. But I think, you know, that after a lesson, if you can go and sit in the chair of one of the kids and just think about how that lesson must have been for them, if you can justify the lesson to a kid, you know, if what was what was relevant, what was interesting, what was what was fun, you know, what did we get too much of? What was there not enough of? Um, in what way did what we what we did um, to touch the lives of the children? And actually, you know, uh, as I watch lesson after lesson, the bit of the lesson that worries me the most is the beginning of the lesson. It's, it's just disappearing and it's disappearing because of things like sims you know trying to get blooming sims to work so you can do the register so the office don't come and get you and um finding all the whiteboards and, and the kids are coming in talking about love island and, you, and, and and they just get directed to their chairs and note down the learning objectives so you just get occupied and then then the lesson just starts and, and and you know i think i think we should punctuate the kids days a bit more say hello and tell them why it's important and the ways in which they're going to be richer in an hour's time, you know. And um, if you can justify your lesson to the kids, then that's good enough for me. 100%. I think um, do a lot of work around starting with why, thinking about the why. Why do we learn? Why do we do everything we do? Um, getting students to take ownership of, of, of their why, you have an understanding of what they're doing and why they're doing it and all of that process. Uh, definitely a great way to end it. So, Martin absolutely brilliant insights been an absolute pleasure to have you on thank you very much mine thank you all very much thank you Cheers.